Chapter Twenty Eight of the Life and Adventures of Michael Armstrong, the Factory Boy. This is a LibriVox recording. Chapter Twenty Eight: An Important Interview, Doubts and Fears. Michael's first recollections on opening his eyes were not of the clearest kind, and it required at least a minute's looking about him after seating himself upright in the cart before he could perfectly understand where he was or why and how he got there but no sooner did all the events of the day before rush back upon his mind that he felt conscious of being near the most important moment of his life again he closed his eyes but not to sleep and fervently prayed that whatever might be the tidings which awaited him he might have strength to receive and bear them as he ought then springing from his resting-place upon the ground he inquired of a lad near him the way to mr bell's and set off to follow the directions he received with no greater delay than was necessary for a short halt beside a little streamlet on the way which offered a welcome opportunity of washing his face and hands before he petitioned for admission to the presence of the good clergyman to whose words he looked forward with an intensity of interest which almost amounted to agony though it was still early mr bell was already in his garden and when the gate opened it was himself who turned towards it to learn the errand of the young stranger michael felt at the first glance that the gentleman who stood before him was the person from whom he was to learn whether the brother he had so long mourned as dead was still alive and he trembled so violently from head to foot that he could not articulate a word what ails you my lad said mr bell gently laying a hand upon his shoulder and looking earnestly in his face you have not the look of one who has done mischief or else i could fancy that you had some terrible tale to tell come into the house and sit down my boy for it is very clear you are not quite able to stand michael still silent followed his considerate host into the house and thankfully received from his hands a glass of water which did him good service for in a minute or two he was able to say i want you to tell me sir may god give me strength to hear your answer let it be which way it may i want to know if edward if my brother edward armstrong is alive or dead but notwithstanding michael's torturing eagerness to hear the answer he put his hand before his eyes because he had not courage to bear the look that might forestall it your brother edward armstrong your brother who then are you boy in the name of heaven said mr bell eagerly i am michael sir michael armstrong but oh for pity's sake tell me what i ask yes boy yes but compose yourself my dear fellow edward is alive and your friend fanny fletcher too michael sunk from his chair upon his knees and lifting his clasped hands towards heaven seemed breathing thanksgivings for this assured confirmation of tidings which till now he had not dared to believe true but startled as he was the anxiety the excitement and the fatigue of the preceding night and day had been more than enough for him and at the moment when every thought would have been joy and every sensation delight he ceased to think or feel at all the colour forsook his lips his eyes closed and greatly to the dismay of mr bell he sunk prostrate on the floor no time was lost before the usual means of restoring suspended life were administered and the uncared-for factory boy the mountain-braced westmoreland shepherd lay extended on a sofa with essences at his nose and the opening of his dark eyes watched for as tenderly as if he had been a delicate young lady a deep-drawn sigh announced to mr bell who stood by anxiously watching him that his remedies had been successful that the boy so long mourned as dead was really and truly alive and a very handsome well-grown fellow into the bargain this is a strange history michael as ever i chanced to hear said he taking the boy's hand and ascertaining that his pulse again made healthful music why we have all been mourning for you as dead for this many a year and now you drop down as if from the clouds and by what i can make out have been fancying on your side that edward was dead too the first thing to do must i think be to give you some breakfast and then if you are strong enough you shall tell me how all this has come to pass full as his heart was and eagerly as he longed for the conversation in which he had so much to learn as well as to tell michael gratefully submitted to this arrangement till having received from the hands of the deeply interested mrs bell herself the refreshment he so greatly needed he felt his young strength return and if he trembled as he turned his eyes towards his kind host with a look that seemed to say now sir i can talk to you it was from eagerness not weakness mr bell understood the appeal and well inclined to answer it said 
having told you that edward is alive and well my dear boy and i only wants the sight that i see now to make him perfectly happy i think you ought to be satisfied and not expect me to tell you any more till my curiosity is gratified by hearing your own history how in the world did it happen michael that when miss brotherton went to the deep valley mills on purpose to look for you she should come back persuaded that you were dead though the charming little girl she brought away with her had seen you there and seemed to know you well michael armstrong told his own story more succinctly than i have been able to do it and probably much better too for he beguiled mrs bell of many tears as she listened to him and bare as the sad narrative was of events her husband also hung upon every word of it as if contrary to the theory which seemed to be pretty generally established in his neighbourhood he thought the feelings and the sufferings of the factory child might be capable of exciting interest when the history had reached its conclusion and michael had fairly brought himself into mr bell's breakfast parlour he paused and with a very eloquent look of entreaty said now sir may i not listen to you yes my dear boy replied his new friend in the happy tone with which a kind heart inspires words calculated to give pleasure yes you have much to hear and a wonderful story it is i promise you but it shall be all true michael so don't fancy that i am telling you a fairy tale and that miss brotherton is the fairy but first tell me before i go any further what sort of a boy was your brother edward when you saw him last oh sir he was the dearest kindest fellow that ever lived replied michael his fine eyes beaming with tenderness and well-remembered love but what sort of a boy was he to look at demanded the clergyman michael closed his eyes as if the better to contemplate the inward picture engraven on his memory his face was a sweet face said he but his dear limbs were crippled he was a slighter boy than me and could not stand the labour of the mill and i fear i fear he added shuddering that my poor edward must live and die a cripple what is your opinion about that my dear said mr bell turning to his laughing wife why i am inclined to think that michael will have some difficulty in identifying his brother when he gets to him she replied instead of being a cripple resumed mr bell i suspect that your brother is a handsomer fellow than you are michael everything promised well for it when he took leave of us and since then my wife has had letters from miss brotherton which do not speak of any falling off in his improvement nay said the lady i have had more than letters to speak of it shall i show him miss brotherton's drawing george most certainly my dear it will save me a vast deal of description and you may trust to miss brotherton's pencil michael as implicitly as to my words for there never was a more faithful limmer mrs bell then opened a little portfolio secured by a key and drew thence a drawing in water-colours the composition and finish of which would have done no discredit to a professional artist how the stout nerves of the young and athletic michael trembled as he received it at first his eyes seemed to fail him the outline the colouring the whole group was indistinct i am a fool sir he said letting the hand that held it drop beside him i positively cannot see i don't much wonder at it replied mr bell but try again michael it is worth looking at and so thought michael as he once more placed it before him and gazed upon it with an eye as eager as that of surrey might have been when contemplating the magic mirror that was to show him what he loved in life and limb the drawing represented a terrace walk along which ran a handsome stone balustrade partially covered by vine leaves while beneath it in the distance stretched to a far horizon a glorious river careening through a rich and varied landscape all this was fair to look upon but the boy's eyes saw it not they were riveted upon two figures that occupied the foreground of the terrace one of these was a slender girl whose bright curls seemed just released from the restraint of a straw hat which she held in her hand but though the head was thus uncovered the features were not visible for the hand was placed upon the balustrade over which she hung as if in earnest contemplation of some object below but the head of the other figure a young man of some twenty years or so was so turned as fully to meet the spectator's eye and if the pencil that drew it flattered not it was one of the handsomest that nature ever formed the large expressive eyes beaming with mingled softness and animation were directed to some object out of the picture but at no great distance for the sweet smile that played about the mouth seemed to indicate that he was listening to pleasant words from some well-loved companion 
the figure of the young man thus represented was tall and graceful his dress was the light summer garb of a southern climate an open book was in his hand his straw hat lay at his feet beside which stood a basket of newly gathered grapes and a small italian greyhound its bright eye looking in the same direction as his own completed the group which spoke in every part of it a sort of graceful ease and enjoyment that it was very pleasant to look upon can this indeed be my edward said michael at length after a long silent examination of the drawing how beautiful how noble how happy how healthful how intelligent he looks is it my own dear pale sickly brother can this be true as true as that you stand there to look at it replied mr bell is there nothing in the face michael that recalls your brother to you yes sir he replied quickly the eyes and the sweet smile are so like my own edward that strange as it is to see him so healthy tall and graceful as he is represented here and looking too so greatly like a gentleman i do quite believe that this was never drawn for any one but him for never never since i saw him last have i seen such eyes or such a smile as that you are quite right there michael the face is one not easily forgotten and i can trace it here notwithstanding all the change of age and circumstance but who do you think that slender girl may be it seems a pity not to see her face the form the pretty attitude the bright waving locks all plainly tell that it must be worth looking at can you guess who it is i suppose it is fanny fletcher replied michael colouring and there too you are quite right but does it not puzzle you to think how all this has been brought about how does it happen think you that those whom you remember in a state so different should now be living as you see them here looking as if their existence were made up of sunshine and sweet air and now again i shall answer as they say the fortune-tellers do replied michael smiling by telling you sir what you have before told me it is miss brotherton whose name i well remember at dowling lodge it is she who has done all this and may god bless her for it but yet truly it still seems a mystery how did it happen sir that this rich young lady should have left her grand house and all her fine acquaintance here to go into foreign countries with two poor factory children you may well marvel at it michael for it is no common act but will you not think it is something stranger still if i declare as i can do with all truth that you are yourself the primal cause of it said mr bill you look incredulous yet so it is do you remember the play michael sir matthew's play cried michael burying his face in his hands oh sir can i ever forget it it was a vastly gay thing too returned mr bell smiling and all the performers were exceedingly admired but you do not seem to remember it with any great pleasure pleasure mr bell returned michael with something like a groan i have suffered a good deal considering how few years i had lived before my sufferings were over but excepting the coming home to my mother's and finding her and teddy gone and as they told me dead both dead excepting then i never was so very very wretched as while sir matthew was making me practice for that play do you remember the very night it was acted when you and he and dr crockley were in a room by yourselves somewhere behind the scenes do you remember michael his beating and abusing you because you had cried upon the stage as well as if it had happened yesterday replied the young man i had to utter false and lying praise about him and something i am sure there was about loving him as well as my dear mother that i could not bear and then it was that the tears burst out though well i knew what i should pay for shedding them they were the luckiest tears that ever boy wept so pray do not quarrel with them replied mr bell while you were paying for them as you call it in the green room miss brotherton by accident heard and saw everything that passed and from that hour she has never forgotten you michael though more than seven long years have passed if i mistake not during which you have never profited by it in your own person i will not enter now into any description of what her feelings were an accident prevented her seeing your mother immediately and when she did my poor boy you were already beyond the reach of any help but she never ceased to inquire by every means in her power whether you had been conveyed and it was then she came to me so it is to you i owe the pleasure of knowing one of the purest and noblest hearted human beings it has ever been my lot to meet with it was in consequence of 
not information for i had none to give but of a hint i gave her as to the nature of the place that she set off on her exploring expedition to that horrid den of sin and suffering the deep valley mills in derbyshire there she met the pretty creature whom she has since adopted little fanny believed that you were dead and this was the dismal news they brought to hoxley lane your poor mother michael but let it comfort you to know that every want and every hardship were relieved from the first hour that miss brotherton saw her and she died with the comfort of knowing that her poor edward would never have to labour more soon after her death miss brotherton took your brother to london for the purpose of consulting the most able surgeons about his lameness their science did not fail them for they predicted that with proper treatment he would outgrow it and so he has completely being at this time not only the graceful well-made personage you see him represented there but healthy active and gifted as i hear with a most rare intelligence for reasons which it is not very difficulty to guess miss brotherton thought that she and her young protégés would find themselves better off on the continent than in lancashire and from the time she first left milford park to visit london she has never returned to it the place is now sold and miss brotherton has no longer any possessions in this neighbourhood and now my dear boy i think i have told you all excepting the exact spot where they now are and this i cannot do because our last letter from her informed us that they were just setting off upon a tour through italy she resided some time ago for one year at paris that the young people might acquire the language but for the most part germany has been their home it is there that your brother has received his education and i think it very probable that it is there they will finally settle for it is in the far-famed valley of the ringhau that miss brotherton has purchased a spacious mansion large enough as she tells me to accommodate half a dozen rich english families with extensive and very beautiful grounds around it and all capabilities for being converted into a delicious residence here he ceased and it was several minutes before poor michael was capable of uttering a single word in return the mention of his mother the hint that she had not long survived the hearing he was dead wrung his heart anew with grief as fresh as if he had lost her yesterday and spite of his manly stature the tears flowed silently but plenteously down his cheeks yet even when he had conquered this there was something so surprising in the present situation of his brother something that notwithstanding all the fond yearnings of his own heart seemed to place them so widely asunder that the joy which mr bell looked for was less obvious then an expression of almost timid embarrassment as he said alas sir what shall i seem like amongst them you speak of my dear edward's education in germany of his learning a foreign language in france while i my best and truly my only education has been looking at nature from the mountain side as i kept sheep and all my learning what i have gathered from a few strangely mixed volumes that i have bought or borrowed during the last four years how can i present myself before them how they can welcome me be so kind my dear said mr bell to his wife without immediately replying to michael's question be so kind my dear as to find miss brotherton's last letter for me i think you took possession of it and i doubt not have preserved it among other treasures of the same kind mrs bell immediately left the room and presently returned with the letter in her hand take that letter michael said mr bell take it into the garden my dear boy and read it alone and without interruption you will find a shady seat where you may be very comfortable and when you have finished the perusal come into my study and tell me what you think of it michael's hand trembled as he took the letter and silently obeying the instructions he received he walked out to an embowered spot where he could not be seen from the house and seating himself on a garden bench perused the following letter with a mixture of trepidation and eagerness which may easily be imagined have you thought it long since you last heard from me dear friends i hope you have for it has seemed very long to me since last i wrote to you but what a thief of time is occupation i have been so very busy in drawing plans for the repairing and beautifying my old castle you would certainly call it a castle in england and so constantly called upon by edward to give my approval to his carte du voyage for our italian tour and by fanny to sanction her plans for our future flower garden and by mrs tremlett to settle some point of enormous difficulty respecting the packing up of the things to be left and the things to be taken that though day by day i have told myself for at least a month past 
that i was behaving most abominably in not writing i have never before found a leisure hour to set about it but if i have not written i have drawn for you witness the view from my beautiful terrace which i shall send with this letter i wish i could have put my own fizz in it to show you how healthy and well i look but unfortunately you know there is no point of sight from which an artist can catch a peep at himself without the aid of a looking-glass and though i pretty nearly live upon my terrace i have not yet taken either to sleeping or dressing there so no mirror was at hand but instead of myself i have given you edward sometimes i do feel a little glorious as i look at him and remember the delicate pale face and feeble limbs that greeted my first sight of him in hoxley lane he is now but you will laugh at me if i attempt to describe him in words the sketch i send is no bad likeness and may give you a tolerably correct idea of the alteration that has taken place as to my sweet fanny though the attempt would have been a bold one i meant to have given you a likeness of her too but her attitude was so picturesquely pretty as she stood unconscious of what i was about that i contented myself with the back of her curly head you shall have her face another time how can i be sufficiently thankful to providence for having redeemed my isolated existence from the state of uselessness in which i vegetated before i met edward armstrong and fanny fletcher not an hour now passes by me without leaving behind it some trace of my having advanced in the precious labour of making these two beloved beings happier were they merely ordinary young people with average hearts and average capacities i should still bless heaven with a grateful heart for having permitted me to be the means of changing their condition from one of great suffering to a life of innocent enjoyment but as it is i know not how to be thankful enough it seems to me dear friends however much i increase my acquaintance with other human beings that edward and fanny are the noblest creatures in the world is it that suffering being of necessity a part of our earthly nature we cannot arrive at the perfect development of all our faculties without it where it arrives in later life perhaps the effect though inwardly healthful may not show fruits so beautiful there is in the minds of both of them a brightness of intelligence and a delicious calm of temper that i have never met elsewhere it is as if a heavy weight that had been painfully crushing them was suddenly removed causing all the ordinary sensations of human existence to be felt as a luxury young as they are they are full of instruction right thinking pure feeling and a firmness of integrity which it is the best joy of my life to contemplate and all this built on so firm a foundation of religious principle that i can have no fears for its endurance after this it would be very weak and womanish folly to dwell much on their personal advantages or even on the peculiar charm of their manners and conversation yet they are gifts which bring a charm to which it is difficult to be quite insensible is it not strange dear friends that being such as i describe them and having passed so large a portion of their lives together in the mutual contemplation of each other's excellence is it not strange that they should not by this time be lovers instead of friends yet such is not the case that they love each other sincerely is most true and i could give a thousand proofs that either would at all times gladly renounce amusement or pleasure of any kind for the sake of the other but they are not in love if i did not believe it impossible considering the age of the parties when they parted i should think that fanny's little heart had been buried in the grave of michael the poor little fellow whose early sufferings under the tender patronage of sir matthew downing first roused my sleepy existence into action she cannot yet hear his name mentioned without betraying a degree of emotion that it is painful to witness and when as sometimes happens edward is taken for her brother it seems to delight her yes yes indeed he is my brother i love him as much and if you ask him he will tell you that i am to him a dear and loving sister i have her say and if edward had been asked i do believe he would have answered and truly too in the same strain edward is now twenty-one and my pretty fanny nineteen but notwithstanding the variety of captivating young people with whom they are perpetually associating i cannot believe that the heart of either has yet received any tender impression though in more cases than one i have had reason to know that they have not been looked at with indifference yet sometimes i am puzzled about edward i think he is less gay and joyous than he used to be at any time indeed the name of michael has ever been sufficient to bring an expression of profound and hopeless sorrow upon his fine countenance which it wrings my heart to see for alas 
how vain must be all my affection all sisterly love to help him there but incontestably of late his spirits have been less gay than formerly this to tell you the truth is the only drawback to the happiness i enjoy could fanny and edward learn to forget poor michael i should hardly have a wish left but i have little hope of this his memory i truly believe is too deeply engraven on their hearts for any subsequent offence to efface it sometimes when i meditate on this sadly enduring sorrow i fancy that i should rejoice if they were both of them to fall in love as a cure for it but alas whenever that happens what a breaking up of happiness it will be for i can hardly hope to find a continental wife or husband for my adopted children sufficiently english in habits and character to permit my inviting them to make a part of my family yet marry abroad they must i think if they marry at all for i will never by my own free will expose them to the mortification likely to ensue upon such an explanation respecting their origin as must be the consequence of any matrimonial negotiation in england on the continent the ample fortunes they will possess with their good education and great natural advantages will suffice to make them very desirable alliances to almost any one but these are anxieties which though they must come upon me sooner or later i suppose i shall endeavour to push from me and forget as long as i can and now i must bid you farewell for during the next month or perhaps longer our course will be directed by circumstances that we are not fully acquainted with as yet but i will write as soon as i can tell you with certainty where your letters can reach us mrs tremlett edward and fanny send affectionate greetings to you all and should it fall in your way to see or convey a message to poor martha dowling i will beg you to tell her that i shall ever remember her with great affection and esteem adieu ever dear mr and mrs bell your grateful and affectionate mary brotherton did one reading of this epistle suffice for michael did two did three it is difficult to say for he remained in a shady and obscure retreat so long that mr bell notwithstanding his previous determination not to disturb him began to think that it was time to see whether all the good news it contained had not killed him with joy and when he reached the bench michael still sat with the precious letter in his hand and his eyes fixed upon it so that it appeared as if he had not yet finished the perusal of it michael looked up as mr bell approached him and immediately rising stepped forward to receive him it was not however any wild excess of joy that his features expressed but there were traces of very strong emotion on his countenance and his hand trembled as he stretched it forth to receive that which was kindly extended towards him you have remained too long alone my dear boy in this cold nook said mr bell taking the young man's arm within his own and leading him towards the house what makes you look so pale michael you are not ill i hope no sir i think not was the reply but i can hardly tell you how i feel at one moment the idea that my dear brother still lives and that it is possible i may again see him hear him hold him in my arms seems to make me too happy to breathe and then again a sort of doubt and sadness takes hold upon me and i do not feel as if it were possible i could ever make one in the happy party on the terrace and why not michael demanded mr bell somewhat reproachfully after reading that letter can you find it in your heart to doubt that the party on the terrace would receive you joyfully will not the happiness be too great cried michael oh how can i deserve it not by doubting the goodness or the affection of those who love you replied mr bell but come i must not preach to you now i believe for i suspect you are not in a condition to profit by it come into the house sit down and grow reasonable as fast as you can and then we will talk of the time and the mode in which you must set off to join your family for your family they are and will be michael you may depend upon it can i throw myself upon miss brotherton sir without her permission demanded michael while his paleness was changed for a moment into a glow of the deepest red i am afraid you have a very proud heart michael said mr bell looking at him and that is not right it is not christian-like oh mr bell replied michael with strong feeling have i not already eaten the bitter bread of dependence and can i at my age and with my power to labour submit to it again you have a notion then young man that benefits conferred by a sir matthew dowling and a miss brotherton are the same thing said mr bell not so sir replied michael i cannot doubt that she who wrote this letter must be both great and good and i well know that sir matthew dowling was neither 
but i only know miss brotherton as one of the fine folks visiting at his house and i cannot feel that i should like to start out suddenly upon her from the tomb as it would seem appearing to expect that she should adopt me too as she has done my brother edward well michael i must not blame you for this because i believe it is very natural yet nevertheless i feel quite sure that you will forget all your notions when you see miss brotherton returned mr bell smiling michael shook his head but he returned the smile though rather languidly and when they had reached the house and were again seated in the study he said what does miss brotherton mean sir by calling miss martha dowling poor martha i trust that no misfortune has befallen her she was very kind to me and i shall always love her although her name is dowling i believe she deserves it michael returned mr bell and by the by you have it in your power to show your love and do her a great kindness by the very simple process of letting her know that you are alive poor girl she has suffered dreadfully from believing that she caused your death by the advice she gave to your mother about signing your indentures and i fancy that letting her know that you did not perish in consequence would be conferring a real blessing on her dear good miss martha exclaimed michael how well do i remember the walk we took together when she went to hoxley lane to give my dearest mother that advice she did it for my good and for my good it would have been if what she advised had been the thing she thought it i owe her still notwithstanding the misery she brought me to the deepest gratitude for her kind and careful teaching during the short time i was in her father's house first gave me the ambition and the hope to learn and spite of my degraded condition i have never lost sight of it and this it is which if anything can may reconcile me to presenting myself as a poor shepherd boy before my well-taught brother you are right there michael replied mr bell it is very clear to me that you have profited greatly by the feelings so inspired notwithstanding the adverse circumstances in which you were placed during the four terrible years passed in the deep valley and such feelings i can tell you will make a vast difference in the degree of happiness you are likely to enjoy in a reunion with your brother and to fanny fletcher too said michael with the eagerness of reviving hope heightening his colour and darting its brightness from his eye to fanny fletcher too i owe the suggestion of thoughts which have saved me from being too utterly degraded to meet her again with pleasure it is to martha dowling surely that i owe all the little book learning i have been able to acquire as well as the power of writing down the thoughts and meditations to which it has given rise but it was fanny who made me feel that however lowly our condition and state on earth we may yet retain as good a right as any of the kings of it to open our hearts before god and ask for his spirit to help us how many mornings have i watched the sun rise how many evenings have i seen him set in glory behind the mountain tops and thought as i lay amidst the heather and worshipped his almighty maker that but for her i should never have known the comfort of loving and trusting as well as of adoring him it was that dear patient little girl who taught me this and perhaps i may yet live to thank her for it i trust you will my dear boy replied mr bell touched with the earnest energy of the boy's manner i trust you will michael and if i mistake her not she will receive such thanks as a very welcome reward for all the pains she took to comfort you such kindness as she showed you is indeed quote, twice blessed it blesseth him that gives and him that takes and i doubt not that she as well as yourself has been the better for it from that time to this may i look once more at that drawing sir said michael with some little embarrassment there it is michael said the clergyman smiling and once more laying it before him were it not that i think you will soon see the dear originals and that we shall not i would ask my wife to give it to you i think i shall learn every line and every shade of it by rote said michael if i do but look at it a few minutes longer there sir he added after an earnest gaze and resigning it into his hands i feel as if it were my own now then after one deep sigh he seemed to rouse himself and as if endeavouring to shake off some feeling that oppressed him he said but you have not told me yet sir the reason why miss brotherton calls my first benefactress poor martha i am sorry to say replied mr bell that there are more reasons than one for applying that pitying epithet to miss martha dowling in the first place she is greatly out of health poor girl and in the next her father's affairs are said to be in a very tottering condition in consequence of his having overloaded himself with a greater quantity of spun cotton than he can get any sale for 
he is said to have lent out money too on some speculation which has not answered and in short that it is rather a nice question whether he will be able to get through his difficulties or not another misfortune is that sir matthew as soon as he possibly could after the death of his first wife thought proper to marry the lady clarissa shrimpton who strange to say thought proper also to marry him and it is said also that poor miss martha who is the eldest of the daughters unmarried is not permitted to enjoy much peace under the rule of her noble stepmother lady clarissa shrimpton said michael with the air of one whom some long-lost image is brought back lady clarissa shrimpton why surely that was the name of the tall thin woman who had to practise the laying her bony hand upon my unfortunate little head when the terrible play was about i dare say it was said mr bell but at any rate lady clarissa shrimpton is now lady clarissa dowling poor miss martha and she is out of health too how can i manage to pay my duty to her mr bell without running the risk of being recognised by sir matthew as the unfortunate boy who escaped from the deep valley he would be able i suppose to make me serve out my time i do not think he would attempt it just now michael was the consolatory reply thank god continued mr bell there has been a good deal said of late concerning the abominations of the deep valley factory and i don't much think sir matthew dowling would run the risk of having it proved that he had kidnapped a boy away to it in the style he managed you i should have no fear whatever of your presenting yourself at dowling lodge only i think it is ten to one her ladyship will not let you get a sight of miss martha without her being present unless you were to write a line to the young lady first and then perhaps she might contrive it michael now rose to take his leave offering with a fervour that was very touching his earnest thanks for the generous kindness with which he had been received but he resisted all the hospitable efforts made to retain him as a guest he had need he said to be alone that he might bring his mind to such a state as should enable him to sustain the wonderful change in his prospects with something like fortitude and rational composure there was more real kindness and true sympathy in the manner of accepting this excuse than the most pressing offers of hospitality could have shown and michael after involuntarily kissing the hand stretched out to bid him farewell took his departure from the clergyman's house with a heart full of thankfulness to god and man End of chapter twenty eight Chapter twenty nine of the Life and Adventures of Michael Armstrong, the Factory Boy. This is a LibriVox recording. Chapter twenty nine. Michael calls his wisdom to counsel, and the points to be discussed puzzle them. An early walk, an old friend with a changed face. To describe Michael Armstrong's feeling as he took his solitary way along what seemed to him the most unfrequented fields he could find would be both a difficult and an unnecessary task that his heart swelled with thankfulness and joy cannot be doubted yet there was a vagueness and uncertainty as to what he ought immediately to do which made him anxious and sad even in the midst of hope and joy the small sum he had been able to save from his wages had been spent or very nearly so since he set out upon his eventful expedition he had already accepted a loan from the friendly old coachman of miss brotherton and he shrunk from the idea of contracting more debts while unable to say with certainty when they should be paid how then was he to reach his brother in his happy distant home and where and how was he to pass the anxious interval that must of necessity intervene before he could even know to what point he should direct his pilgrim steps even had he the means of setting forth the path he had taken proved to be a short cut leading into the high road from fairly to ashley and on quitting the fields he found himself close to the door of a public-house which he was tempted to select for his shelter as long as he remained in the neighbourhood both because it was lonely and because it was humble having entered there bespoken a bed and made a very frugal repast he inquired the distance to dowling lodge and finding it was greater than he could traverse on foot with any hope of returning in decent time to occupy his newly taken lodging he resolved to wait till the following morning when by setting off at daybreak he might be able to make his visit to martha and perhaps report the result of it to mr bell before he slept his mind had too much on which to employ itself for him to feel the afternoon a long one an orchard close behind the little inn afforded him shade and soft turf whereon to sit or lie or to pace backwards and forwards with unequal steps 
as he meditated on the chances for and against his ever being one in the happy thrice happy party described by miss brotherton nor had he wearied of these exciting but most anxious thoughts when the moon and the stars and the heavy dew warned him at length that the day was gone and night come and then he remembered that in order to follow mr bell's advice he must prepare himself with a letter to miss martha which it would be necessary to write before he went to bed fortunately his hotel was able to furnish the needful implements and after a little reflection he penned the following note a poor lad to whom miss martha dowling once showed much charitable kindness is now waiting at the park gates to know if he may pay his duty to her he takes the freedom of asking for this favour because he has been told that she would be pleased to hear he was alive and well having directed this to miss martha dowling and sealed it in the best manner he could he retired to his little bed in a state of mind that hovered between inexpressible felicity and anxiety that he was hardly able to bear he was afoot in time to hear the lark's first overture on the following morning and his spirits cheered by the bracing influence of the delicious hour and by the sound sleep which had preceded it enabled him to breakfast on a slice of brown bread bespoken the night before and laid ready for him with a draught of icy cold water from a neighbouring well without any mixture of melancholy though he thought the while of all the dangers and difficulties he might have to encounter ere he stood beside his edward on the beautiful terrace to which his dreams had transported him so easily michael was a stout walker and had reached the well-remembered precincts of dowling lodge soon after the earliest servants were stirring he had made up his mind to be the bearer of his own letter and accordingly having shown the address to the woman at the lodge as a reason for being permitted to enter he approached the stately mansion by the road which led to the offices and entrusting his epistle to the first female he encountered requested her to deliver it to miss martha without delay why she be ain't up yet said the girl looking at him however with a good-humoured smile with which light-hearted young damsels are wont to greet such very handsome lads as our michael but perhaps you will be so good as to let her have it as soon as she is awake he replied returning the smile well poor thing and that may be now most likely returned the girl for her cough often wakes her before this time will you wait for an answer i won't trouble the servants by staying here replied michael but if you please you may tell the young lady that i will walk up and down the road till she can let me have it does miss martha walk out early in the mornings as she used to do he added that's just what she likes best poor thing replied the girl but you needn't be a fear that she's gone out already for if she had i should have been sure to have seen her for she never has the great door opened for her at this time of day for fear of disturbing my lady who always lies unaccountable late and does sir matthew rise early now demanded michael with some anxiety he not he he eats and sleeps like a pig they say but he is grumpier than ever he was both to men and maids too since he married the new lady i wonder as i never happened to see you before as you seem to know em all so well it is several years since i was last here returned michael but run upstairs with it there's a dear girl will you because i want to get my answer and be off you had better stop here till i come down again replied his good-natured messenger instead of walking up and down the road without knowing whether there's an answer or no sit down in the kitchen and i'll be back in no time and into the kitchen he went the self-same kitchen which just eight years before had been the scene of his painful examination by sir matthew dowling's servants he remembered the room perfectly could have pointed out the exact spot where the awful housekeeper sat and the place where he had himself stood with no better champion to sustain his courage than the greasy kitchen-maid whose pitying broad face bent over him he recollected as perfectly as if it had beamed upon him but the day before he was still deeply revolving these interesting reminiscences and the strange contrast they offered to his present hopes when his envoy returned miss martha wants to know your name young man she said but she is getting up and will be walking in the park as usual she says presently so it is likely enough that she will give you the answer herself very well replied michael perfectly satisfied good morning i am very much obliged to you but you haven't told me your name and miss martha says that she should like to know it my name isn't one that would make any difference he replied so i won't trouble you to go up again about that good-bye 
and without waiting for any further discussion he walked off exceedingly well pleased at having arranged the wished for tete-a-tete so satisfactorily the noble dimensions of the park enabled michael to select a space amply sufficient for his promenade which was neither within sight of the mansion nor the lodge and ere he had made many terms upon it he perceived the lady he wished to see approaching him he could not doubt that it was martha for at that hour of the morning none other was at all likely to be there but she was too much altered for him to recognize her in any degree he thought she was taller than he had expected to see her but at any rate she was greatly thinner and so delicately pale that her appearance was rather a contrast than a resemblance to what he had expected to meet she was already near him when he turned upon the path and met her he stopped took off his hat and bowed respectfully you are miss martha dowling ma'am he said interrogatively yes replied martha that is my name but when did i see you before young man i do not know you it is a great many years miss martha but i can never forget your kindness the pale cheek of martha was tinted with a vivid blush as she exclaimed if it were possible if i did not know that he was dead but this is nonsense she added recovering her composure i quite forget your person young man she continued after a pause but if i have ever done you any service i am glad of it perhaps if you tell me your name i may remember the circumstances to which you allude oh miss martha replied michael i am afraid my name will startle you and therefore i do not like to speak it but i think it came into your head just now only you stopped short and said it was impossible can it be michael armstrong that i see demanded martha in an agitated voice it is indeed miss martha he replied it is michael armstrong come back to thank you for all your great kindness to him my kindness to michael armstrong she exclaimed alas it was i who occasioned all his sufferings and as i have thought for many years his death how is it you have been saved michael how is it you have escaped from the horrid place to which i was the cause of your being sent my dear miss martha returned michael greatly affected by her look of ill health and by the agitation she displayed for tears were trickling fast down her pale cheeks my dear miss martha he said i know if nobody else does the kind motive that you had for every word you spoke and it was not i myself that said i wanted to go miss martha when we walked together from here down to poor mother's house never never can i thank you enough for all your goodness then as well as at all other times from the first moment that i ever saw you thank god cried poor martha fervently clasping her hands and raising her eyes to heaven you know not michael what a load you have taken from my heart i have for years lived under the dreadful weight of believing myself to be your murderer the thought has haunted me by night and rarely quitted me by day and my poor father too this crime at least he has not to answer for michael could not help thinking though for worlds he would not have lessened her pious satisfaction by uttering the thought that though he had escaped with life from the terrible sufferings to which he had been exposed he owed sir matthew but little gratitude for it fortunately however for his veracity he was not called upon to answer this observation for martha immediately added does miss brotherton know that you are alive michael no miss martha she does not he replied my brother edward is living with her in some place abroad and till yesterday i have existed in the dismal belief that he was dead and that i had not a single relation in the whole world and where are you living michael what is your home now and how did you escape from the dismal place to which you were sent as an apprentice in answer to this michael related as briefly as he could contrive to do it all that had happened to him confessing freely that he had run away and that he supposed he was liable to be sent back again to work out his time if sir matthew discovered that he was alive and if it were his pleasure to do it we will not talk of anything of that kind michael said martha a bright blush again visiting her cheek it would not be prudent certainly for you to make yourself known here and i particularly desire that you will not do it i am grateful oh most grateful for your coming to tell me that the dismal news of your death was not true but now that you have set my heart at rest on that score do not come here again michael lady clarissa is very particular about everybody that comes to the house and in short though i shall always have the greatest regard for you michael 
i would a great deal rather that you did not come to darling lodge again michael perfectly understood though it was evident she would not avow it that poor martha had fears for his safety should sir matthew discover him and without giving her the slightest reason to suppose that he saw this he assured her that he was going immediately from ashley without any intention of returning to it martha then looked at her watch and seeing that there was still above an hour to spare before the usual time at which the family came downstairs ventured to seat herself on the trunk of a newly felled tree while she questioned the youth for whom she still felt the strongest interest as to what his projects were and when and how he thought of leaving england to join his brother with frank and touching simplicity michael entered freely into all his harassing doubts and difficulties confessed that he had not a shilling in the world that he could call his own and worse still that he could not help feeling a strong repugnance to throwing himself wholly on the charity of miss brotherton for no other reason in the world than because she had nobly provided for his brother to know that edward is alive and not endeavour to see him is impossible he continued but i would fain earn money enough if it were possible to enable me to get to him without being chargeable to her and once within reach of him once near enough to his dwelling-place to know that we need never be many days asunder i should not fear but that i might earn my living without being indebted to charity for it i was always stronger than edward you know miss martha and there is no reason because he lives an idle life dear fellow that i should do so too michael she replied her whole countenance lighted up with the most animated expression of pleasure my dear michael armstrong your coming here is certainly the greatest blessing that heaven could have sent me i cannot tell you and you can never know all i have suffered from believing you were dead and from knowing that i had been the cause of great and terrible suffering to you and that too wholly owing to the trust which you and your poor mother reposed in me may you never my dear boy know what it is to have a conscience burdened as mine has been be very sure that it is worse than anything you could have suffered at the deep valley michael when you see mary brotherton tell her that i owned this to you and perhaps she may think at last that she judged me rather more harshly than i deserved if she judged you harshly at all she was very wrong replied michael warmly people should know before they judge nobody who really knew you could judge you harshly i had rather that kind sentence came from your lips michael than from those of any other human being if you can say it and mean it too as i am sure you do who is there living that can have a right to say the contrary yet this is not my only pleasure i happen to have the power and i bless my poor father for it of making some little atonement for the years of suffering that i so unwittingly caused you from the day we were each of us fifteen we have received an allowance of sixty pounds a year for dress and though i really never wanted one half so much as my sisters my father who has ever been a kind father to me has always insisted upon my having the same and at the marriage of my two elder sisters he gave me a hundred pounds each time that i might be smart but i have no taste for finery michael it always made me melancholy so i am very rich i really do not know how rich for i have always kept on laying the bank-notes that i did not want in a drawer and i have never counted them think if it will not be a pleasure for me now to open that drawer and give you all that is in it oh with what different feelings shall i go to bed to-night from any i have felt for years past i am sure there must be enough to take you to italy or wherever else miss brotherton may be gone and to set you up in some little business into the bargain wait here only ten minutes my dear michael and i will return with my treasure a real treasure now and for the first time that i ever thought it so martha had risen from her seat as she spoke and literally before michael could recover from his astonishment sufficiently to answer her she was already at some distance from him he had by no means settled to his satisfaction the question of whether he ought or ought not to strip the generous martha of her little hoard when she again appeared but she looked hurried and out of breath make haste michael dear michael she said with much agitation for pity's sake let not me be again plunged in all the misery of self-reproach from which i have so recently escaped take this parcel michael nay never stay to count them my father has left his room may have inquired for me and even now may be following me bless you michael bless you go go for goodness sake and leave the country as quickly as possible with these words she turned from him 
and with a step too rapid for her state of health and plainly showing her extreme anxiety she hastily retreated towards the house though after hearing mr bell's decided opinion that no further danger was to be feared from sir matthew dowling michael would himself have felt not the least desire to run away from him yet it was impossible not to perceive that martha was of a different mind and that for some reason or other she was exceedingly anxious that he should not remain near dowling lodge or in other words within her father's reach whether she were right or wrong in fancying that it was necessary for his safety that he should keep out of the way he felt that it would be cruel to oppose her and with the unexamined roll of bank-notes thrust into his coat pocket he gave but one farewell look at the retreating drapery of poor martha and then with rapid strides and thoughts so full of the scene which had just passed that he followed the right path rather mechanically than from judgment he set off upon his return to the humble lodging he had secured for the night End of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty part one of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy this is a librivox recording chapter thirty michael grows rich and takes a very delightful walk back to westmoreland his preparations for a longer journey are suddenly stopped he makes a painful visit but meets many old acquaintances part one the morning's walk had been a long one even for michael armstrong and right glad was he to find himself again in the neatly sanded kitchen of his little inn with a loaf and cheese before him of sufficient dimensions to resist any attacks he could make upon them a moderate proportion of beer in addition to the solid meal these afforded refreshed him so effectually that he determined to take his leave of mr bell that night preparatory to setting off on his return to westmoreland on the following morning in order to bid farewell to his good old master there on the subject of martha's bank-notes he meant to be entirely guided by the advice of the clergyman being equally fearful of offending or rather of paining their generous owner by refusing to accept them or of depriving her of what might be hereafter useful by agreeing to do so i have seen miss martha sir were his first words on entering mr bell's parlour and both look and accent showed that the interview had been an interesting one but alas she is greatly altered he added restraining with difficulty the tears that rose to his eyes i fear she is very ill but she was glad oh so glad to see me sir she has been fretting poor dear young lady under the false notion that she had been to blame about me but thank heaven thinks she knows better now and perhaps when her mind is at ease again she may recover health i can't bear to think how pale and thin she has grown and all about me to whom she was the best and kindest friend that ever poor boy had and see sir what she has done now continued michael drawing forth the roll of notes from his pocket here is a large sum of money i believe she did not rightly know how much it was herself she told me because she had kept on putting by what she did not want and had never accounted how much it came to and i'm sure i have not counted it either but whether it is a little or much i don't feel quite certain whether i ought to take it mr bell smiled at the unusual manner in which the rich-looking but carelessly packed roll of paper had passed from one hand to the other before he examined the contents he questioned michael as to all that the generous-hearted girl had said to him on bestowing it and the young man's faithful answers soon convinced him that there would be little kindness to the self-approaching martha in refusing a donation which she evidently considered as an atonement and which would he doubted not by its application to michael's necessities do more towards healing her wounded mind than any other thing whatever you must not refuse the gift michael said mr bell after hearing his narrative to the end i do not wonder little as she has been to blame in the matter at her having suffered greatly for all that she innocently made you suffer nor am i at all surprised since it was in her power to do so that she should wish to make you this atonement it comes at a lucky moment my dear boy for not only will it enable you to present yourself before miss brotherton without throwing yourself as you said yesterday upon her charity but i suspect it may go far in assisting your hopes of entering into some business which may enable you to support yourself mr bell then opened the bundle of notes and found that they amounted to rather more than five hundred pounds a sum which to michael appeared so enormous that he uttered something like a remonstrance against the opinion which advises appropriating the whole did you not tell me sir he said that sir matthew dowling's affairs were not considered to be in so flourishing a state as they had been 
and may not this money be wanted by miss martha in case he should really become involved in difficulties i think there is no danger of her wanting it michael returned mr bell let what will happen i have no doubt that sir matthew will be able to secure sufficient from the relics of his enormous wealth to maintain his family in easy circumstances a sum like this my dear boy is but a drop in such an ocean michael resisted no longer and this point being settled his plan of operations was soon arranged in deference to martha's fears for his safety he decided not to visit his good friend richard smithson at milford mr bell undertaking to settle the matter of the loan and moreover to convey to the kind-hearted man the assurances of michael's well-doing of his gratitude and hearty good wishes the letter from the travellers which was to settle the happy michael's road would probably arrive within a week or two and mr bell recommended that having paid his farewell visit to westmoreland he should return to fairly and there equip himself in such a manner as would be suitable for presenting himself before miss brotherton mr bell agreed to take the custody of his treasure till his return and with his bundle again on his shoulder and five pounds in his pocket michael set off to walk over the fells and moors he had to traverse with a lightness of spirit that seemed to strew the deserts with flowers and made every blast that blew upon him as soft and sweet as the gales of araby it was not the least perhaps of his pleasures as he strode sturdily along to compare his present walk with that which had conducted him from the deep valley to ashley four years before the suffering the terror and the final agony of that expedition could not come over his mind however without throwing a shade over his gladness but it chastened without obscuring the bright combination of objects that glowed in the prospect before him and altogether it would be difficult to find any walk on record more replete with enjoyment than this of michael to the humble mountain home that had so kindly sheltered him it was with a very flattering mixture of joy and sorrow that the good statesman and his family accepted michael's farewell and listened to his happy hopes and it was amidst blessings and hearty good wishes that once again he sallied forth to wend his way for the last time over the mountains and bid a fond and lingering adieu to his beloved lakes and tarns he felt that those had been to him as teachers and preachers elevating his heart and imagination and preparing him more effectually perhaps than any other school could have done for the different sphere of life in which he now hoped to move on reaching fairly he found that a letter had arrived from miss brotherton enclosing one to martha dowling which had been forwarded immediately and which by what the kind-hearted heiress said to her fairly friends seemed to have been written in consequence of the reports which had reached her respecting the failing fortunes of sir matthew miss brotherton was at nice where it was her purpose to remain for some months to nice then the thrice happy michael prepared to go a respectable wardrobe and all other necessary equipments were easily procured in the neighbourhood his place to london taken and all things ready for his setting off save that he still expected an answer to a very cautiously worded epistle which he had ventured to address to martha informing her that he was setting off for nice and that any letter or message she might wish to convey to miss brotherton should be carefully delivered by her faithful humble servant m a michael was at breakfast with his kind and hospitable friends when a lad bearing great marks of hasty travelling in his appearance made his way into the room and with a look that seemed to prophesy eventful tidings if he were but asked for them delivered a letter to mr bell this proved however to be only a blank cover enclosing one to michael which was handed to him while the eyes of his host and hostess fixed themselves with some anxiety on his face michael tore open the despatch and changed colour as he read it then giving an intelligible glance at the messenger who ceased not to wipe his forehead with one arm while he held his hat squeezed to his side with the other he said i should like to speak to you about this mr bell go into the kitchen my lad said the clergyman and get some breakfast you shall know when the answer is ready though evidently disappointed at being thus dismissed unquestioned the boy consoled himself with the hope of a kitchen audience and making his reverence retired what in the world have you got there michael demanded mr bell not good news i am afraid no indeed sir replied michael very far from it it is from miss martha dowling who seems to be in great distress read it to us my good fellow will you if there is no reason to the contrary what is written here sir cannot long be a secret from anybody this is what she says dear michael pray come to me at dowling lodge directly there is no longer any danger to be feared from my poor dear father for he is very very ill 
and i think you can be useful to me which i am sure you will be if you can alas michael you will witness a dreadful scene my poor father has kept everything secret to the very last meaning i am sure to prepare his family for it as well as he could i could not think what it was made him send all my sisters away to arabella and harriet the two little ones indeed as well as the three youngest boys are all at school so that i am the only child he has left with him my elder brothers being all away in their different professions i tell you all this now michael because i shall i suppose have no time to say anything but on necessary business when you come here do not delay i am sure you can be useful to me in great sorrow your friend martha dowling poor girl this is sad indeed cried mr bell i imagine though she does not explain herself that her father's affairs are fallen into confusion yet i cannot guess what you can do for her however you must go immediately of course and you had better hire a chaise that no time may be lost and i would advise you michael to take with you the pocket-book which mrs bell packed up for you so carefully last night i fear that it is but too likely your prediction will be fulfilled already and that the poor young lady may be glad to have some of her notes returned thank god that i was not gone replied michael fervently it will be the greatest pleasure of my life if i can be useful to her little time was lost in setting off and certainly much before his arrival had been hoped for by martha michael who left his post-chaise at a public-house near the lodge was walking towards the mansion by the same path in which he had so lately parted from her on entering the kitchen the scene which met his eyes explained at the very first glance the nature of the business carrying on upon the premises a number of men were standing about some few occupied in sticking slips of paper inscribed lot number blank upon a variety of articles which appeared to have been collected there for the purpose others with black canvas aprons and paper caps were coming and going with no very apparent purpose while another set with cold meat and beer flagons before them sat round a small table in a corner discoursing upon themes which appeared to occasion them much merriment but among all these there was not one that looked like a servant of the house and taking advantage of the confusion which seemed to license the freedom he walked on without speaking to any of them and determined to trust to his memory for finding the small morning parlour which used to contain all poor martha's little literary personalities and in which all his reading and writing lessons had been received neither his recollection nor his conjecture deceived him he found the apartment he sought and on opening the door discovered martha sitting there but she was not as he had hoped to find her alone on a sofa placed opposite the window sat a figure bolt upright in the middle of it with a sofa-table before her entirely covered with trinkets delicate sevres china miniature bronzes and other valuable knick-knacks a quantity of cotton wool lay on the sofa beside her and her long lean fingers were actively employed in selecting the most precious articles enveloping them in the wool and then cramming them into a large basket that stood before her sometimes selecting one either smaller or more precious than the rest and thrusting it into her pocket or upper sleeve a large indian screen was spread before the door which induced michael on hearing a voice that certainly was not that of his friend martha to remain unseen long enough to decide whether his entrance would be likely to occasion her any embarrassment i tell you martha that you talk like a fool and that is what you always were and always will be said the upright lady in a shrill voice but in a tone that she was endeavouring to reduce to a whisper what right can any one of those horrid dirty fellows have with what is mine i should like to know i am not going to be made bankrupt or sent to jail or have my property seized because your abominable wicked low-born brutal treacherous false father has been found out and is going to be treated as he deserves as for you and all the rest of your family there is nothing to be said or done i suppose but to submit and just do what you can to get your bread with such blood as you have got in your veins there will be no great harm done if you were all to go out as housemaids and footmen the thing happens among low people continually if the father gets into distress but i should like to know who ever heard of a woman of quality the daughter of an earl being treated in the same sort of unceremonious way but indeed lady clarissa it will be a great deal worse for my father if it is found out that his wife has been endeavouring to secrete property said martha his wife indeed a pretty sort of husband he has made of me hasn't he having my noble arms painted on his paltry carriages and engraven on his plate not a single ounce of which had been twenty years in his possession 
and then vulgar wretch insisting upon seeing my housekeeper's account for fear i should save anything out of the money he allowed me pitiful cheating brutal manufacturing savage but thank heaven my slavery is at an end to-morrow will see me many a good mile on my way to scotland the monsters say i may take my clothes and my money and my clothes and my money i will take i promise you miss martha so i will really advise you to go and collect your own things and see them put together decently you may be able to sell some of them perhaps which might be very useful and that would be spending your time much more profitably and decently too than sitting there lecturing me upon what i may and what i may not take i shall take everything that belongs to me and there's an end of that and i wish to my heart you would just go away and leave me in peace did i not know lady clarissa that my father would suffer for it said martha rising i would not have troubled you with my remonstrances but i am certain that you are now occupied in abstracting things that of right belong to my poor father's creditors and if it is discovered it may be the means of their refusing his certificate and he may be thrown into jail for life and where would he be better miss martha i am sure i don't know my belief is that he is mad or going to be mad and i don't see but a jail is as comfortable as a madhouse and as it must be a great deal cheaper it will suit his circumstances a great deal better i wish you would go child and see if there is such a thing in the house as a basin of soup for my luncheon i may ring and ring but there is not a creature that will answer the bell now martha made no reply but she rose from her chair and michael stepped back into the passage that she might not meet him within hearing of her selfish stepmother you are come then exclaimed the poor girl on catching sight of him this is very kind of you michael if you will walk this way with me there is nobody in the great drawing-room now i will explain my reasons for sending for you michael followed her to the well-remembered drawing-room which had so often witnessed the display of sir matthew's munificent charity by showing him off to all the neighbourhood the recollection was very hateful to him yet the right-hearted lad felt a pang as he accompanied his benefactress into this greatly altered scene of former splendour the whole house was under preparation for a sale by auction and nothing could exceed the speaking state of gilded desolation which this fine room exhibited never mind the confusion michael just step over these curtains we can sit down up in that corner of the room take care of the mirrors my dear boy surely they have thrown these costly things about more heedlessly than was necessary said poor martha as she led the way rather over than through the scattered mass of splendid furniture with which the room was strewed it is strange michael she resumed as soon as they had seated themselves in a clear space of six feet wide where two chairs were standing near one of the windows it is strange most strange that you should be the only person that i could think of to assist my poor father in his misery you who have suffered so severely from from his displeasure but i found out michael that you had a kind good heart when you used to talk to me of your mother and poor teddy it was that which made me take notice of you then and it is that which makes me ask for your assistance now and happy and thankful shall i be if i can do you any good miss martha replied michael eagerly i have brought back the notes all but about twelve pounds that has been laid out for me it is a very large sum miss martha and i trust it will be useful to you i do not want it my dear boy replied martha smiling through her tears but i am glad to find that i was not mistaken in you no michael let me still under all circumstances have the unspeakable comfort of believing that i have been able to make you some little atonement for all you have gone through from my ill-judged and ignorant advice you would make no difficulty about keeping what has been accumulated out of my hatred of silks and satins michael if you could guess the extraordinary good it has done me to know that you are alive and well and less destitute than you would have been had you never seen me i thought i was dying michael before your little note reached me but now strange to say spite of all the calamities which have fallen upon my family since i feel as if i might still live long enough to be useful to my poor father alas michael his condition is very dreadful for some months past i have perceived a great alteration in him his memory has failed him and at times his temper has been so variable that i have seen him violently angry and very intemperate in his language one minute and enduring the insolence of lady clarissa with the meekness of a child the next and now in short michael i greatly fear that his reason is shaken by the misfortunes that have fallen upon him 
he has kept all his commercial disasters so completely to himself that not even his most confidential agents were at all aware of their extent and i therefore hope that if i can contrive to remove him from this melancholy scene his mind will be relieved by feeling that the worst is over and that i may have the exceeding happiness of seeing him restored to reason and to health and in what way then can i be useful to you my dear miss martha i dare not combat your will but it seems to me that if his creditors are stripping his house in this way such a sum as you have put into my hands might be very useful to him said michael and so it would certainly my good friend if he had not provided for the exigences of this terrible moment by having a large sum of ready money in the house a fact which he has confided to me only replied martha his marriage with lady clarissa she continued has been a greater misfortune to him michael than any losses in his business could possibly be she has led him a most wretched life constantly keeping his high spirit in subjection by threatening to bring her brother upon him if he treated her with any want of respect and my poor father's reverence for rank and title is such that he has submitted to her in everything but during the terrible fortnight that has passed since the disclosure of his ruin her conduct has been perfectly frightful and i feel quite certain that when she has taken herself off to scotland which she intends to do to-morrow my father will feel so greatly relieved that the very best effects upon his mind may be hoped for from it what i want you to do for me michael is this you must procure a post-chaise to be at the lodge gates to-night at twelve the men who are left in charge of the house get both tired and tipsy before that hour and will be in bed and asleep and then i think i shall be able to get my father away from all the irritating objects which surround him here he has been very ill with violent spasms and confined to his bed for a day or two which one of the maids tells me is the reason why he has not been more strictly watched they think he is too ill to get away but he is greatly better to-day and though i have persuaded him to remain in bed i think he has quite lost the complaint and will be able to get off if you will do what i desire of you i know not another being that i could trust my poor father has spent a great deal of money and been very liberal to many but i do not know one whom i do not suspect would be more ready to betray than to help him if they saw him endeavouring to get away his physician dr crockley a man on whom he has heaped innumerable favours is i strongly suspect acting as a spy upon him and it is because i expect his daily visit presently that i will not let my father get up therefore you see michael there are some difficulties to be encountered do you think you could manage to get a chaise to the gates without its being known that it was for him i am quite sure of it replied michael for to save time i came hither in a chaise myself which is now waiting at the public-house to take me back to fairly i have only to go and tell the boy that i shall not be able to return before night in order to have him ready to start at any hour you please to fairly said martha musingly but it is no matter he may sleep at the inn there as well as at any other and the next morning we must make our way to the nearest port where there is a chance of our finding a steamboat going to france it will not do at present for my father to remain in the country when he has got his certificate he will be safe but i greatly fear some difficulty about it while martha was thus explaining her hopes and fears the sound of carriage wheels was heard slowly approaching by the road which led to the chief entrance and which passed at no great distance from the window at which they were sitting here comes dr crockley she exclaimed i am very glad his visit will be over so early this will give me time for preparation but she was mistaken the equipage she heard approaching was not the recently set-up cab of dr crockley but the donkey-chair of the ever-active mrs gabberly nothing could be much farther from poor martha's inclination than encountering the prying old woman at this moment but having hastily told michael to appear as if he were employed in taking a catalogue of the furniture for which purpose paper pens and ink lay conveniently ready on one of the marble slabs she hurried out into the hall for the purpose of meeting the physician and attending him as usual to her father so that the avoiding mrs gabberly was impossible oh my poor dear martha that's you is it well now you was just the person i wanted to see but i do wonder you did not get off with your father poor man when he made his escape this morning said the unchanged little lady i know not what you mean mrs gabberly replied martha gravely my poor father has been extremely ill and is at this moment confined to his bed 
the old lady gave a wink with one of her little cunning black eyes and nodding her head very expressively replied old birds are not caught with chaff my dear what is it that you mean mrs gabberly that you do not believe me said martha indignantly you are very foolish to bawl out in that manner my dear with that young fellow that's cataloguing in there close within hearing mind it is your fault and not mine if he suspects anything from your violence you are taking an account of all the looking-glasses are you not said martha approaching the drawing-room door and addressing michael you may come into sir matthew's room now if you please he was asleep when i sent you away just now then turning to mrs gabberly she added perhaps you would be so good as to see my poor father mrs gabberly i would not wish you to stay long with him for he is very feverish but i dare say he would take it very kindly if you will just come in to inquire for him End of chapter 30, part 1chapter thirty part two of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy this is a librivox recording part two looking a good deal surprised but accepting the invitation with great alacrity mrs gabberly began to mount the stairs exceedingly well pleased to have an opportunity of procuring so excellent a ticket of admission to every house in the neighbourhood as this ocular demonstration of the actual condition of the fallen knight would furnish michael in compliance with the order he had received followed after and in a few minutes found himself once more in the presence of the man under whose tyranny he had suffered so terribly but a harder heart than michael's might have been softened into forgiveness and forgetfulness of all former injuries by the miserable aspect of the wretched man who lay stretched upon the splendid bed that he could no longer call his own his steadfast-minded and affectionate daughter the only earthly good that avenging heaven had left him entered first intending to announce the visit of mrs gabberly but sir matthew started up in bed and before she could speak cried out do not let that devil crockley come to me martha i will not see him i tell you i have got no pain now and if i had don't i know he would rather give me poison than physic he is going to lose his annuity you know it is mrs gabberly dear papa just come to ask how you are said martha leading the old lady to the bedside she will not stay because you are not well enough to talk but you will be glad to see her will you not glad said the miserable man knitting his brows and throwing upon her a look of deep aversion don't i know her is she not the town crier of all the country round have i not paid her for it a hundred times and do you think i don't know what she is come for now somebody else will pay her now for bringing them word how the poor bankrupt dowling looks well now that is terrible to be sure exclaimed mrs gabberly he is quite shook in his mind do you think he would be outrageous if i was to feel his pulse my dear i should like to prescribe for him i should indeed poor dear man his talking about paying me is comical to be sure let me feel your pulse sir matthew shall i sir matthew looked so very much as if he would have liked to take her up in his enormous hand and throw her to the further end of the room that martha thought it prudent to prevent her nearer approach you have now seen my father mrs gabberly she said with emphasis and that i think is all that can be necessary for your satisfaction oh certainly it is very satisfactory she replied but without appearing to have the slightest intention of leaving the room for in truth it was at that moment the place where beyond all others she best liked to be the downfall of sir matthew dowling was a subject that employed every tongue and nobody could be so welcome to every drawing-room and every dining-room too throughout the neighbourhood as one who could testify to having seen him listened to him and ascertained how he seemed to bear it it was impossible that any person could have been better qualified for the service than mrs gabberly willingly would the still brisk little lady have crept under the toilet-table or the bed itself rather than have lost so glorious an opportunity and instead of attending to martha's repeated assurance that she had better go now she began opening sundry physic vials that stood on the table at the bottom of the bed smelling some tasting others and pronouncing judgment upon all it is quite a mystery to me my dear 
what dr crockley can be thinking of giving such medicines as these to your father said she i see plainly enough that he is in a very inflammable and irritable state and he ought to be put altogether upon the depleting plan then putting her finger on her lip in sign of secrecy she whispered i'll just stay here martha behind the bed curtains till dr crockley comes and i think it may be very useful for us to have a little conversation together i know my poor dear father's method in these cases as well as he did himself and he was regular bred you know which is more than we can say of poor dear dr crockley exceedingly provoked martha now addressed her father saying mrs gabberly wishes to stay papa till dr crockley comes in order that they may have a consultation about you but you won't like that shall you like it replied the prostrate man with bitterness oh dear yes i shall like it vastly they are exactly a fitting pair to come together glowering and gloating round the bed of a ruined neighbour let her stay by all means martha let her stay and watch it all see mrs gabberly there is a young auctioneering gentleman come to take an account of the furniture isn't it pleasant i am sure it must do your heart good to see it don't go away young man he continued addressing michael who shocked and disgusted was making his way towards the door don't go away go on never mind losing a little time i dare say you will be paid for it all the same and my dear good neighbour would not enjoy it half so much if she did not see something of the kind going on oh dear oh dear quite wild and wandering isn't he calling crockley and me a pair too as if we ever thought of such a thing i am sure for one i can answer for it that i never did his doll of a wife you know hasn't been dead above a year and i've no notion of such quick work it is quite indecent i think good gracious me now she continued catching sir matthew's fierce eye fixed upon her with a mixture of hatred and bitter irony what have i said i'll bet a guinea he fancies i mean something about his marrying himself up all in such a hurry with lady clarissa lady clarissa cried the knight in a loud voice that's right i had very nearly forgotten her ladyship go to her this moment martha tell her to come here is she not my wife bone of my bone flesh of my flesh is she not mrs gabberly and shall she not come hither and share with me the delight of seeing a broker taking possession of my furniture and a dear good soul like you looking on go martha go when i tell you and bring the right honourable lady clarissa dowling here i am quite certain she won't come papa said martha leaning down and whispering in his ear so don't make me go to her but she shall though shouted sir matthew even if i go down and fetch her myself my dear mrs gabberly my sweet mrs gabberly will you have the great condescension to go for her you used to run about if i did but hold up my finger you know and you would not be so ungenerous as to refuse now merely because i am a bankrupt go to my lady clarissa if you please sweet mrs gabberly and tell her that as she is a daughter of the noble house of highland lock i wish before we part to give her a parting token of remembrance she knows that i wear a magnificent diamond ring mrs gabberly and you may just hint to her if you please that nothing has been taken off my body yet i do assure you it will be a very pretty touching scene for you to witness and talk about it will indeed i am quite determined to have a sentimental parting and as she has told me that she means to set off to-morrow this will be just the right time for it won't it mrs gabberly perfectly well disposed to execute the commission and quite as desirous as sir matthew could be that the proud poor lady who had ever treated her with haughty coldness should be properly humbled she darted towards the door in order to perform her errand but martha remembering the manner in which she had left her stepmother engaged stepped forward to prevent her quietly saying if my father wishes to see his wife mrs gabberly i can go for her without troubling you and i really wish you would permit me to lead you downstairs to your donkey chair at the same time i am sure you must be aware that papa is not in a state to bear seeing company 
you are quite right my dear quite right indeed sir matthew is looking sadly wild and feverish and i should say that nobody whatever but the doctor and his own family ought to see him of course i suppose it would not be very convenient to hire attendants now for these sort of people i am sorry to say always insist upon ready money which is a cruel thing under such circumstances but so it is and therefore it follows that you and lady clarissa must be the chief nurses certainly ma'am it will be his own family who will wish to attend to him and therefore if you please i will take you downstairs and see you to your carriage me my dear cried mrs gabberly in the shrillest possible tone surely you cannot mean to call such an old friend as i am company no no my dear martha don't think me such a brute i would not leave you just yet for the whole world you shall go yourself my dear if you will and bring her ladyship up i will stay here as quiet as a mouse and watch by your poor papa but perhaps it might be as well to desire that young man to finish with his scribbling and get out of the room he must have gone over everything by this time mustn't he i will have her right honourable ladyship here before that fellow stirs a step martha do you hear me that's more than half the fun cried sir matthew bursting into a shout of laughter doesn't she know our kind clever observing neighbour who has come here so thoughtfully just to look about her a little doesn't she know her almost as well as i do and won't she enjoy thinking what a pleasant description dear mrs gabberly will be able to give of my lord highlandlock's sweet daughter watching the broker and seeing that he sets everything down fair thankful was martha that the supposed broker was one who could not in reality add to the horror of the scene she turned to him as she left the room saying you had better remain here if you please till i return upon which he modestly ensconced himself in a distant corner of the room and resting his paper upon a commode continued as he stood to scribble upon it quite certain that it would be impossible to get rid of mrs gabberly till her father's summons to his proud wife had been obeyed and greatly more anxious to clear his room of this troublesome guest than to spare the feelings of her ladyship martha entered the little sitting-room determined to deliver the message concerning the diamond ring if she could not prevail without it she found lady clarissa in the act of finishing the packing of her basket by laying on the top of it sundry light articles of female attire very cleverly calculated to make the whole pass under the general description of wearing apparel which the courtesy of the law permits to be removed by all persons in the unfortunate situation of her ladyship now i hope you will cease your impertinent preaching miss martha she said as the pale and agitated young woman entered the room unless every separate nightcap and frill are to be examined one by one by these brutes i conceive no objection can be made to this package gather up the cotton wool and poke it somewhere out of sight directly martha obediently set herself to collect the scattered fragments of the suspicious-looking wool but as she did so said my father wishes to see you lady clarissa insolent wretch exclaimed her ladyship pausing in the act of collecting various little articles for which she had not found room in the basket have you the audacity to bring me this as a message my father says lady clarissa that as you are going to leave him to-morrow he should wish to see you once more replied martha monster screamed lady clarissa stamping her foot upon the floor he see me again he dare to lift his bankrupt eyes upon the noble woman he has so basely injured tell him you bold messenger who fear not to face the descendant of a dozen earls to convey to her the words of a bankrupt cotton spinner tell him that the only atonement he can make is to die tell him this from me and may the ostentatious settlement his unprincipled pride made on me excuse me in some degree in the eyes of my noble brother for the degradation i brought upon him by accepting it these last words were uttered with clasped hands raised eyes fervent accents and all other ordinary indications of uttering a prayer indignant and disgusted martha felt no scruple in employing the means her father had given her for obtaining the interview he desired and quietly said in reply to this burst my father stated that his motive for asking to see you lady clarissa proceeded from his wish to present to you as a parting gift the diamond ring which he wears on his right hand 
the effect of these words was as sudden as that produced by the magic touch of a hand employed in turning off gas that indeed is a most natural wish unhappy guilty man i can well believe that had he the crown jewels at command he would deem them all too poor an offering to atone for the offence he has committed against me i thank god martha dowling that my noble blood has never taught me to forget that i am a christian there are many women believe me there are of less exalted rank than myself who would not deign to obey such a summons but i feel what my duties are and i shall nerve my courage to perform them come with me to my dressing-room martha carry that basket for me and then i will go with you to the bedside of sir matthew martha attempted to obey but the basket was too heavy for her to carry and she set it down again declaring that the task was beyond her strength a tolerably good joke that said lady clarissa endeavouring to laugh considering your origin but this is the last day of such pleasant jestings and therefore i must bear it with good humour i suppose then applying her own much stronger hand she lifted her treasure and was stalking off with it but stopped short ere she reached the door saying no i will stay here while you go and fetch my faithful mistress saunderson she enters into all my feelings thank god and is as strong as a highland pony in the bargain having obediently performed this commission and brought back the faithful scotch waiting-woman who had adhered very steadfastly to her mistress through all the vicissitudes of her fortune martha at length succeeded in marshalling the lady clarissa dowling into the bedroom of her husband no signet ring ever made a deeper impression on wax than the diamond one of sir matthew had done on the memory of his noble wife and her first glance as she entered the room was directed to the hand which lay on the bedclothes that she might see if it had already been removed but no there it sparkled still and with a gentler aspect than she had been seen to wear since the tremendous hour when the declension of sir matthew from the richest commoner in the county into a bankrupt had been announced to her she said you wish to see me sir matthew martha says you wish to see me yes my beloved replied the knight i do wish to see you angelic sweetness how can i do otherwise look at yourself in the mirror most beautiful clarissa look in the mirror before that broker there carries it off and tell me if you think it possible that any man could bear to part with so much beauty without having one final gaze upon it and see my dear here is your amiable neighbour mrs gabberly is it not kind of her to leave all other visitings that she may come to nestle herself here among the very brokers in the very centre of our misery it is so heavenly minded of her isn't it i guessed indeed that one great reason for her making such a tremendous sacrifice was the hope of edification from beholding the christian spirit with which your ladyship bears your ladyship's overthrow and besides her own improvement from it she wishes to have it in her power to describe it to the whole neighbourhood very right of her isn't it my dear and that is the reason why i sent for you in general the nose of lady clarissa greatly outblushed her cheeks which had more of the jonquil than the rose in them but now from the tip of her high forehead to that of her long chin she became crimson and but from the remarkable length of her throat which seemed to rear itself in defiance of such danger a fit of apoplexy might have been expected be gone you vulgar gossip picker she cried turning in uncontrollable rage upon the terrified little woman and tell the contemptible neighbourhood through which you are going to crawl in your donkey cart like a snail in his shell leaving your slime as you go tell them all from me that the best consolation under my remorse at having forgotten my own dignity by condescending to hold a place among them arises from being released from the degradation of associating with so contemptible a being as yourself and all who are capable of listening to you and having uttered these words in a piercing voice she rushed to the door threw it with great violence wide open and so left it as she paced with rapid but tragic strides to the shelter of her own boudoir and the sympathy of mistress saunderson it was perhaps because the door was open and that he knew the sound would follow her that sir matthew burst into the most violent shout of laughter that ever made itself heard from mortal lungs it terrified martha made michael armstrong shudder and caused mrs gabberly herself to wish she were anywhere else notwithstanding the very valuable information this extraordinary scene would enable her to communicate 
long did this frightful laugh continue and when strength seemed to fail and the boisterous merriment could be sustained no longer a vehement and reiterated hissing followed which at length ended in such complete exhaustion that sir matthew fell back pale and apparently motionless upon his pillow mrs gabberly said martha i must beg you to leave us now you must perceive that my poor father ought to be alone it is very important fearfully important i am afraid that he should be kept perfectly quiet give me leave to wish you good morning i must say that it does seem very odd in you miss martha to persist in calling me company good gracious to think of the terms on which i have always been in this house before your poor papa's unfortunate marriage i cannot and i will not leave you in such a condition it would be perfectly monstrous and everybody would call me a brute for it till dr crockley has been here i really neither can nor will go i am quite determined that i will hear what he says about him let her stay said sir matthew in a hollow whisper which proved that he was neither asleep nor dead though his closed eyes and ghastly countenance might have been mistaken for one state or the other martha went to him took his hand wiped the profuse perspiration from his brow and then placing herself in a chair beside him continued to watch his altered countenance alike unmindful as it seemed of the presence of mrs gabberly or that of michael either the lady perfectly contented to be thus quietly established as a looker-on determined for the present neither to move nor speak lest she might lose the valued privilege thereby but michael became so conscious of the awkwardness of his situation and so fearful lest martha from forgetting him might get into a scrape likewise that he ventured to approach the foot of the bed on tiptoe merely for the purpose of recalling himself to her recollection and then on seeing her start at the sight of him he said in a whisper i suppose i had better go downstairs now miss martha martha in reply to this nodded affirmatively and in the same low tone added i shall have other business to speak to you about do not go away till you have seen me michael's eyes were naturally turned to martha while this passed but when he withdrew them and was about to make his retreat he caught the large wide open wild-looking eyes of sir matthew fixed earnestly upon him the young man involuntarily dropped his eyelids for the gaze was a frightful one and he turned to leave the room stay roared a hoarse but loud and stunning voice from the bed stay devil demon halberd what do you come here for cowardly blackguard do you think i do not know you you never dared to come till it was too late for me to hold you i have heard of your purring round the place weeks ago but you escaped me then base runaway what do you come spying here for did you think i should not know ye did you think i should forget those d blank hypocritical lies and that hateful curly hair of the devil's own colour no my pretty prentice i have not forgotten your crocodile looks and never shall i suppose you thought you should bring me to repentance by sending home word that you were dead was that it eh i am able now sir matthew to pay for leaving the mill before my time and i am quite ready to do it if you please replied michael gently but he spoke to one who heard him not sir matthew had a neck as short and thick as that of his lady was long and thin his last interview with her had not been a salutary one for a man in his state of mind and body and the subsequent discovery of michael of whose visit to the factory he had heard from parsons and at whose escape he expressed the most unbridled rage accelerated symptoms which had before threatened him and sent such a rush of blood to the brain as instantly produced apoplexy and left him totally deprived of sense and motion martha whose eyes were fixed on him uttered a fearful shriek and threw herself on the body believing that he was dead but mrs gabberly knew better she had practised too long as an amateur not to know a fit of apoplexy when she saw it and promptly exclaimed get away martha get off him child he is not dead i tell you and if we could but bleed him he would open his eyes again fast enough with the rapidity of lightning poor martha obeyed she withdrew herself from the bed endeavoured to raise her father in her arms and by the help of michael succeeded she then bared his arm bound her own waist-belt tightly around it and with unshrinking courage had thrust a sharp penknife which she drew from her pocket into a vein 
before the skilful lady who had prescribed the measure had half recovered her astonishment on perceiving that the poor girl had conceived the project of putting it into immediate execution the old adage that where there is a will there is a way was never better illustrated than by this act of the tender-hearted and invalided martha she felt that her father's life hung on the promptness with which the operation was performed she felt too that if she shrunk from it there was no one else who would perform it and totally forgetful of herself and her own feelings conquered the rebellious weakness that would have held her hand and did what two minutes before she would have believed it utterly impossible she could have done the result did honour to the skill of mrs gabberly the lazy current flowed though reluctantly sir matthew opened his large eyes rolled them from side to side heaved a deep and heavy sigh and presently attempted to speak but this was beyond his power what more should be done said the pale and now trembling martha turning towards mrs gabberly why now my dear you must just let him alone for a little bit replied the physician by hereditary right well now she added wasn't it a blessing that i was here if i had not stayed he would have been dead as mutton by this time End of chapter thirty